Thank you so much for joining us today, and please join me in welcoming our speaker, Marietta Kimberary. Thank you so much, Kristen, and uh, welcome to everyone who's uh, made it out on this kind of gray day, but I think it's turning into a sunny sort of Florentine uh, day uh, and turning back into summer from what I can tell. So um, we're going to spend some time this morning uh, thinking about some of the themes in, uh, that are related to the Della Robbia exhibition, which I do hope you have all seen. And if you haven't, please uh, take some time maybe after the lecture or over the course of the next few months. We close on December the 4th, so you have some time. Uh, so um, here's the entrance to the show. And uh, we are going to look at a few of the objects in quite great detail, because what I would like to do with you this morning is explore some themes that are important in Florentine Renaissance art in general, and in particular that will help you to, um, I hope, enjoy the show even more. So this, the exhibition is uh, based on um, the technique that was invented uh, by Luca della Robbia in the 1500s, in the 1400s in Florence. And it was considered in his own day a new invention. And so this, uh, my title, Creative Ingenuity, uh, is really the key here. It's, a, it's, the, it's the loose translation of an Italian word, which is on your sheet, uh, uh, the word ingenio. And it is this uh, notion of creativity uh, and in ingenuity, ingenious creativity, that really characterizes the Italian Renaissance. So that's going to be the theme of our lecture today. So Luca uh, was born in Florence in uh, 1400 or 1401. And so he really, uh, it's basically that date that and for many people, marks the beginning of the Italian Renaissance. And he was born in Florence, and I show you a, um, a map of Florence, uh, uh, a view of Florence that was made around 1500, and uh, it really hasn't changed very much. So some of the places that we're going to be thinking about today, the Cathedral of Florence, it looks pretty much the same. Here's the uh, Palazzo Vecchio, um, uh, Ponte Vecchio leading over to Palazzo Pitti. Florence hasn't changed very much. Uh, in, uh, in, and here's the wonderful Arno River that runs through the city. And the Arno River actually plays a very important role in uh, Luca's invention of a glazing technique for terracotta sculpture. And that's really what our show is about, this technique for clay sculpture that was gathered uh, at the banks, on the banks of the Arno, someplace like this, uh, uh, by Luca and his family. Uh, to create sculptures in this clay that was a wonderful light-colored, calcium-rich clay. And uh, just luckily enough, the Della Robbia actually owned land on the Arno, so they had a kind of constant source of this clay for creating sculpture. The second part of this uh, invention is uh, the glazing technique that Luca uh, invented for making sculpture, uh, glazed terracotta sculpture, which in the 16th century, Giorgio Vasari basically describes Luca as the inventor of this art form. Uh, and uh, it was especially appealing because it was not known to ancient sculptures, sculptors. So this is a great thing in the Renaissance. If you can outdo the ancients, you're doing well. <clears throat> and Vasari described it very lovely, in a very lovely, with a very lovely phrase. He called it a new beautiful and useful art. Uh, and it, for Vasari, the important, other important thing was that it made clay sculpture almost eternal. And again, if you're almost eternal, you're kind of like ancient sculpture, right? You're going to endure over time. So uh, that's the basic, uh, that's the basic um, view of this material in the Renaissance. So here's modern day Florence. I hope that many of you have visited the beautiful city. Here's the Arno running through. Here's the same buildings that we've just looked at, the cathedral, the Palazzo Vecchio. Right in here is a, is a, a building we will look at in a, a, during the course of the lecture, or San Michele. Uh, Florence is in a little valley. It can't grow that much. So it hasn't, it has, that center of Florence really hasn't changed all that much uh, since Luca and uh, his family were working there. 
Uh, here's the famous and wonderful Cathedral of Florence and the Cathedral Complex, the Cathedral, the Baptistry, and the Bell Tower. Uh, and I show you the Baptistry of Florence. It's dedicated to St. John the Baptist. And uh, St. John the Baptist is the patron saint of Florence. And this is where all Florentines were baptized in the Renaissance into, uh, into their church and into their faith. And uh, in the Renaissance, they actually believed that this uh, hexagonal uh, building was an ancient Roman temple. So they really believed that they were uh, directly linked to the, to the ancients. We know that it was actually built in the 11th and 12th centuries, but they already in 1400, 200 years later, uh, they already believed that this was an ancient Roman temple and that was really important to their sense of civic identity. Uh, and um, the periods that we're talking about, for example, I show you um, an old photograph because uh, at this point, um, many, of the, uh, many of the sculptures that are on the baptistry are actually in, their, in the museum now. So um, here you see the famous uh, uh, bronze doors for, to the baptistry made by Lorenzo Ghiberti in the, about 1525 to 15, it took a long time to get them done, to about 1550. Uh, and it's just possible that this is where Luca got his training as a goldsmith working on these doors, which Michelangelo a century later would dub the gates of paradise. And the way we see them today in, is in all their splendor in the new cathedral museum, where you can see they are behind glass, but they have been beautifully conserved. And you can see the brilliant gilding uh, of these objects. And so we, we speculate that Luca della Robbia actually trained uh, with Ghiberti um, working in his shop probably in the in um, the 15 you know teens to 20s um, but the epitome of creative ingenuity in Florence in the Renaissance really was the construction of the great and famous symbol of Florence the dome of Florence Cathedral which was built by uh, by um, Filippo Brunelleschi, and it was completed uh, up to this point, so this whole section of the dome, was completed in 1434. So um, what was so special about this? Well, the, 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 the thing was that when uh, the cathedral was planned, they planned this enormous crossing this very big space that had to be spanned. Uh, it was planned, the, the cathedral was first um, planned in the later 13th century. It took about a century to get to the point where they actually needed the dome. So when the cathedral was planned, they kind of didn't worry about it. And they figured, now well, when we get there, we'll figure it out. And it actually took Brunelleschi uh, uh, to uh, come up with a plan to bridge this really large space um, because it was so big, they couldn't build any kind of scaffolding to support the dome as it went up. So he had to come up with a very creative way to build the dome so that each level kind of supported itself as the dome grew. Because if they had put wooden armature inside, by the time they got to the top, it would have sagged and the dome would have collapsed. So he came up with a very ingenious uh, structure of a double ring which is contained within, within the dome. And this was immediately appreciated and understood to be a, an accomplishment of the greatest genius. So this kind of creative ingenuity, epitomized by the Florentine Cathedral dome, uh, is, the, is the world that Luca della Robbia is working in. Um, it's really one of the most exciting uh, periods of, of creativity in all the arts um, in, in, in our history. So here's the interior of the space, and you get a sense of how just how uh, vast the dome is. Leon Battista Alberti, who was a Florentine, who, uh, whose family, and this happens a lot in the Renaissance, his family had been exiled. He came back to Florence in the 1430s, and he praised um, Brunelleschi uh, for this accomplishment, uh, recognizing the great genius. Um, and he said that the, you know, the, the dome of Florence Cathedral could um, could protect the entire population of Tuscany below its, uh, uh, within, its uh, within its compass. Uh, so the, the sense of identifying with the, 
this creativity in Florence really centers around the notion of the dome and the actual execution of the dome. So in, 15, in 1434, uh, they were ready to consecrate the, the crossing of the cathedral because the, finally they, had, they could move out of the nave and into the area under the dome. So there's a lot of activity going on in the area under the dome. And um, that is where we find Luca della Robbia working for sure for the first time. And he is responsible for carving this uh, beautiful, uh, it's called the Cantoria or singing gallery. It's actually an organ loft. And it was originally placed right over here. So today there's a modern organ and it was moved out of here uh, in the 19th century. But originally it was right here, so right under the dome. And it is um, a, a wonderful um, uh, marble sculpture which, um, which uh, illustrates, literally illustrates Psalm 150, which is a psalm of, um, of praise to the Lord. Uh, which goes, you know, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, uh, blah, blah. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet, praise him with the harp and lyre, praise him with timbrel and dancing, praise him with strings and pipe, praise him with the clash of, sim of, symbol, of, the clash of symbols, praise him with resounding symbols. So Luca's imagination of this, uh, of this psalm, which is actually inscribed in beautiful classicizing lettering, on the, on the Cantoria, imagines groups of Florentine children singing and dancing and playing instruments. It's really one of the most uh, charming uh, representations of music and also of childhood uh, that, um, that you could possibly imagine. Unfortunately for Luca, at the same time, another artist was also creating a marble Cantoria or organ loft, and that is the great sculptor Donatello. And Donatello imagined uh, this uh, singing gallery a little bit differently. He, um, instead of breaking up the, the panels into the, the, the area into these individual panels, he came up with this idea of creating a kind of crazy, energetic, running freeze of, 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 of angels who are passing uh, um, garlands along and just so animated and so energetic. And you can also see that it's extremely, actually extremely colorful. I show you a detail here. For example, there's use of color in these decorative areas. There's sparkling gold mosaic behind. And um, somehow, um, Luca's Cantoria, which is much beloved and extraordinarily beautiful, but somehow it always comes in second when, when people think about the Donatello Cantoria, which is too bad because I show you some details from Luca's beautiful uh, reliefs, and you see these incredibly adorable, charming uh, faces of children, wonderful energy, wonderful uh, detail, wonderful insight. But Somehow this competition perhaps uh, made it clear to Luca that maybe he wasn't going to be able to compete with the great marble sculptor uh, Donatello, who also was a great sculptor in marble and bronze and uh, bronze and terracotta. This is one theory as to why um, the next sculptures we know of by, by Luca della Robbia are actually in this new material, his invention, of glazed terracotta. And they are two reliefs that were made also for the cathedral and also for under the dome. So here's the dome. The cut here would have been Luca's Cantoria and here would have been Donatello's. And we're looking at these reliefs. Do you see them? Right in the, uh, over the sacristy doors, again, in the crossing of the cathedral. And this is the moment of the great debut of this material that Luca has invented. And it shows, these, uh, it shows the resurrection of Christ and then the ascension of Christ. And if you've been in the, in the exhibition, you'll immediately recognize the classic shiny uh, contrast between the blue and white and also some wonderful col uh, colors of green. Um, and so this, uh, in the... Uh, 1440s, so the, the resurrection dates to um, 1442 to 4, uh, the, the 
uh, ascension, is it just a little bit later, 1448 to 51? So this is this spectacular debut of this material in the, un, again, we're under Brunelleschi's dome, we're in the most important church in Florence, at the most exciting uh, moment of creativity. And so uh, what is this material? We know that, um, that Luca had done some earlier experimentation. And I show you a sacramental tabernacle that he made probably around 1441, so just before he gets the commission for the, um, for the cathedral reliefs. And you can see it's, a, it's actually a combination of marble and this glazed terracotta. So this relief, for example, so, oh wait, so up here you see these swags, purple, blue, green, down here, uh, blues and greens and blacks. Those are all done in this material of glazed terracotta. And so um, the relief of the uh, Pieta, of the dead Christ supported by angels and mourned, uh, supported by an angel and mourned by his mother and his uh, beloved disciple John the Baptist, uh, John the Evangelist, this is carved in marble. So this is marble relief, but it's set against a background of blue glazed terracotta, and you can see that here as well. So this was kind of a, a, a first step towards uh, this invention that we will see in the, um, in, the, uh, in the cathedral reliefs. And it seems to recognize a kind of visual quality that we still can relate to today that is still going strong, the way blue and white really uh, help figures and forms to stand out. And I can never resist showing the Matisse cutout of the, big, of the great blue nude, uh, because it really gives us, it reminds us that visually this quality of blue and white is so powerful. There's something inherent in that, in that contrast. And what Luca is able to do is, um, is really focus on how he's going to make things visually more clear and percepted because if you're in the Duomo and you're looking up at these reliefs, they're quite far up, and you want something powerful that's going to carry over space. And uh, Florentine sculptors uh, had already been um, exploring these ideas in the 14th century. We're now, here's the dome again, we're now back outside and we're gonna look a little bit at the great bell tower of Florence, which was built in the 14th century and was designed by the famous painter Giotto. So they were, these, these artists were able to work in a wide variety of materials. And so here you can see that where people are, right? This is the height. So um, this section, we're going to ha have a quick look at that, uh, at some of, the, some of the objects that were uh, put onto the baptistry. One went over, one, uh, went onto the bell tower. One of them uh, goes over one of the entry doors. And this adorable Madonna and Child is, uh, is by the, the sculptor Andrea Pisano, working around 1340, so about a century before Luca. And so what, you, what do you see? You see a marble sculpture set against a blue background of small um, glazed earthenware tiles. So this blue and white uh, is already being explored quite a bit in Florence uh, for uh, architectural sculpture. Um, and there's another view of this adorable Madonna and Child. We're, keep this in mind because we're going to look at this, this again when we start to look at some of Luca's Madonna and Child images. Um, but you see this, this, the, 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 this pattern of, of tiles behind the figure. So here we are standing with the crowd. You see the series of reliefs on the first level of the, of, the, of the bell tower. But do you see up here, can you make out the way these figures are all set against blue? So uh, they must have seen right away that you know, maybe they need to do a little bit more to make these higher reliefs visible. And so uh, today you can see a group, you can see the group that is uh, that, uh, on the baptistry in the Cathedral Museum, where you can see the way, here's Andrea Pisano's Madonna and Child, but you can see the way these little narrative scenes are also set against the blue. So this is where Luke is coming from when he, um, when he makes a big leap and decides to do his figures in 
glazed terracotta along with that blue background. Uh, and why? So we think a lot about why he would shift from blue to uh, from from marble to terracotta. There's a, a, a long-standing, uh, pervasive notion that what Luca was doing was actually saving money, that because clay is cheaper than marble, um, it's easier to work. Marble is hard to carve. Marble is expensive. It's heavy. Um, I believe that Luca appreciated the brilliant, beautiful white of marble, but I don't believe that he started to work in this material because he didn't want to work so hard or he didn't want to pay so much for his materials. I think what he was seeking was a material that was actually even more visible and legible than white marble against blue because the shine and the, the, um, the purity of the whites that Luca achieved are different from marble. It doesn't, it doesn't really look like marble. It does if you look at it at a glance, but the, but the quality of the glazing uh, that Luca achieves in those whites, they're whiter than marble. They're pure, they're, it's a pure white. And I've said again and again um, that in, in this material, white really is a color that Luca has to work to achieve. So I, I don't want to go too much into the technical aspects of this technique, because next week we're going to have a terrific lecture really focusing on the technique, but I want to just tell you what the very basics of the technique involve. I've already talked to you about the clay, right? That Luca, Luca's family owned uh, land on the Arno, and they had this beautiful clay that actually was then perfectly suited and worked, uh, refined, and was perfectly suited to take the glazes that Luca invented. And the fundamental thing that differentiates Luca's glaze recipe from uh, the work that was done, for example, those, um, those um, tiles at the back of the marbles, but especially the glazes that were used on earthenware vessels, uh, is that he adds higher levels of tin and higher levels of lead. And those two, those two um, um, materials provide the opacity. You can't see through these glazes to the clay. You, so the opacity, the purity of the color, and the brilliant shine. The high levels of tin also contribute to the brilliance of the whites. So that's, that's the fundamental difference. There's, it, there's much more to it, but, the, but that is um, the major um, invention there. Um, so, um, so here we look a little bit more closely at Luca's first relief of the resurrection of Christ uh, in this new material. And it's, uh, it's so interesting because one of the earliest descriptions of Luca's uh, uh, reliefs in the, in the Duomo uh, it, it's um, a, a writer who actually was a biographer of uh, Brunelleschi. And he describes Luca in the 1480s. So we're about 40 years later, but it's a, one of the first written descriptions of Luca and the material. He says that Luca was a master sculptor of bronze, marble, and clay, and he was the first to discover how to glaze figures. He describes, um, he describes the, um, the reliefs in the cathedral as made of figures of glass, or rather glazed clay. So even in the 1480s, there was a little bit of confusion as to how to describe these unusual figures. He, doesn't, he, he, he calls them figures of glass, which gives you the notion of reflectivity and shine and um, almost a kind of transparency. And then he realized, well, they're not actually probably, they're not transparent. They're not really like glass. And then he goes, he, 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 he corrects himself and he says they, they're made of glazed clay. So, um, so that notion of not even knowing how to, how to describe them tells us that in, the, in their own time they were surprising. And people understood that they were looking at something quite different 
from the marble that we had, we've been looking at. So I, I show you here um, a little montage where I put the Cantoria back over the door. So here we have Luca della Robbia as marble sculptor, brilliant marble sculptor. Luca working as a uh, terracotta artist with this brilliant new technique that he invents. But you should also be aware that he also made these bronze doors. So he really could do uh, everything. And Manetti was especially impressed because he said, you can go in the cathedral and see these three, see him achieving the, this, these, three, um, these three arts at the highest level. So, um, so after he completes the, the, the resurrection, uh, he's contracted by the cathedral board to do another relief for the other door. And it is the um, ascension of Christ. And you see Christ ascending to heaven with his uh, apostles and the Virgin Mary uh, watching this happen. And in the contract, they say that they want him to make the mountains and the trees their own color. So that white, uh, the white, um, and just to go back quickly, so here all of the, the, uh, the greenery is actually also white. So the cathedral board seems to have been wanting to push Luca towards a greater degree of naturalistic work so that this would be more like nature. So you have the mountains being a little bit mossy and the trees being green. Uh, and that is different, as you see, from, um, from it, how, how, how the whites in, are used. It's really b pure blue and white. With uh, And this is always, always true in, in the Della Robbia. The eyes are always glazed. Uh, in colors, uh, usually, so very, very small use of other color on the figures, but al always in the uh, in the eyes. Uh, so I wanted to show you an example of blue and white in in um, maiolica or pottery. This is as good as it gets. This is actually in our collection. You can see it up in the Renaissance corridor. It's a wonderful. It's only about this big. Not, not, not monumental like that, uh, but it is a drug jar. It was used for pharmacy. Uh, so, so, and uh, you can see this is blue and white if you're working in the traditional um, myolica te technique that Luca relied on, but so far surpassed that it was seen to be a different, uh, a different technique. So typically for myolica, what you would do is you'd form your, your vessel, you'd fire it, you it comes out of the kiln. Very typically, they would dip it in a white glaze. And that's what you see, sort of the base, uh, the, all of the white of the background. And then they would apply blue or black, a kind of a, a, kind of a purpley, dark purple that reads as black here, uh, over that white underlayer, and then fire the piece again. The fundamental difference for, for, for achieving Luca's glazed terracotta uh, glazing is uh, that the blue is applied in one single layer, the white is applied in one single layer. There's no, uh, there's no underlayering or painting over it. These two, you would form the figures. Uh, you can get a sense already that I hope that you can see that there are, it's actually made in pieces to go into the kiln. You'd form those pieces, you'd fire them, they come out, and then they apply the glaze in one single dense opaque layer. So that's why when you look closely at the drug jar, do you see how you can sort of see the white sometimes coming through the blue and gets a little, a li there's a little bit of bleeding of color. It, for the Della Robbia, you get this purity and uh, very distinct areas of blue and white. So that's sort of the fundamental uh, difference and the fundamental leap forward in the technique. It's a, it's a, it's a big leap forward uh, in this type of material. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a couple of other things, this pair of reliefs now. So we have the resurrection of Christ, uh, where uh, Christ is, uh, has been uh, laid in the tomb, and soldiers are left there to guard him to make sure nobody comes to take the body away. Uh, and while they are asleep, Christ rises from the dead, right? And he is uh, surrounded by angels. This, this Bible, this, uh, this story is not recounted in the Gospels. Nobody saw this. This was not witnessed. So um, what, we, what happens 
Christ rises from the dead, the, 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 um, the soldiers do ultimately wake up, and the three, uh, three women who were followers and friends of Christ go to visit his tomb the next day, and they find the tomb empty. So this critical moment actually uh, is the visualization of something that's not recounted in the Bible. And so you have the soldiers who sleep through it. Uh, and in contrast to that, this scene of the ascension, which is witnessed by Christ's apostles and his mother, is recounted in the other lunette. So um, in a certain way, it's the, it, it, it helps to uh, encourage people to believe even in the first. These are really beautiful pendants. They work together. One doesn't work without, one doesn't work as well without the other. And one of my favorite moments in this is that you see how the soldier is sleeping right at the, right at the base of the relief. You, as a believer, do not want to sleep through this event. You need to get over that sleeping soldier and wake up to the belief that this actually happened. So here, in this scene where Christ ascends into heaven, do you see the way that the figures have been organized? And this little area is open. They kind of move downward. That allows the viewer and the worshiper to be included in the scene. So you, can, you fill this spot. So here, the soldiers sleep through it. Here, the believers uh, witness, and you too become a witness to this event. And you picture this, these, where, where we've seen that these reliefs go, they're right under the dome, they're just behind the high altar of the church, so they relate very closely to the liturgical events that take place in the, in the church itself. Um, it's such a, beautiful, um, a, such a beautiful weaving of sacred history into the function of the church. And um, in the 1430s, I've already mentioned Leon Battista Alberti, who praised Brunelleschi for, the, for, the, for his dome. Well, Alberti writes a treatise on painting. And he dedicates it to Filippo Brunelleschi. And, he ta he, and, and when you do a dedication in the Renaissance, you actually talk to the person you're dedicating it to. So he says to, to Filippo Brunelleschi, and you know, um, you created this amazing thing, Florentine genius, uh, and it's so wonderful to see how you and our friends, uh, and he lists four other artists that he considers the people that are really reviving the arts in Florence in this moment of the 1430s. The dome is built, they're creating all these wonderful things for the, for the cathedral, and he lists Donatello, Ghiberti, who made the, great, the Gates of Paradise that we looked at briefly. Masaccio, who by that time has, has, is, is not painting it. He's, uh, he's dead, but he's a young painter uh, in Florence. He lives to, to about the 1420s. And Luca della Robbia. So Luca is included among this great pantheon of Florentine uh, artists. And I have to say that for, the lo for a long time, it's People have been slightly confused as to why Luca, who, uh, whose reputation uh, didn't always, uh, didn't always uh, exalt him to the level, say, of Donatello and Ghiberti, uh, well, what was Alberti thinking? And you have to wonder, because he, Alberti would have known the Cantoria, but he's writing before these two sculptures are complete. So we have to ask ourselves if Alberti knew about the work that Luca was doing to create this great invention. But I, what I also think is that Luca, who's the youngest of this group, he's in his 30s. Donatello and Ghiberti are, you know, good 15 to 20 years older than him. That Luca is, needs to rise to this challenge that he's put in this group of Brunelleschi and Donatello and Masaccio and Ghiberti. And I always like to think about what people might have said when they saw these reliefs for the first time. And I can, you can imagine people walking into the cathedral and saying something like, yes, Luca, this is what you should be doing. You know, this is great. <laughs> this is your thing. And maybe he thought that to himself. Because one of, the, one of the great things about the Renaissance is that there was this desire that you 
as an individual, fulfill your greatest talent. And with this invention and with these reliefs, Luca does that. So I just show you again the, the wonderful sleeping soldier. Uh, so you know, so Luke is telling these sacred stories, uh, and he is he is uh, trying his hardest to make them expressive, engaging. Uh, that will they will um, support the story and support the, the the devotional and liturgical experience. So he turns to sources like. A classical sarcophagi, and I show you a, a sleeping figure from an, a, a figure from a sarcophagus that's in Pisa. Much of this art, uh, some, so do you see the lying figure, and he's got his arm thrown over his head. This is a classic gesture of sleep in the Renaissance, and so he's reinterpreted that uh, in, in this wonderful, uh, dreamy sleeping soldier. Um, that we should not emulate. We have to wake up and believe. Uh, but it's an extraordinarily beautiful figure. Um, and um, so the other, uh, the other thing that Alberti talks about in his book on painting is just exactly this, how to make narrative um, compelling. And so these two reliefs also fulfill a lot of the uh, notions that Alberti puts behind the most important thing that a painter and a sculptor can do, and that is tell stories vividly and expressively. So uh, the notion of historia or narrative is embedded in these wonderful reliefs as well. So Alberti and Luca uh, need to be uh, considered more closely together. Um, I'd like to turn now to a work that is actually in our galleries, uh, because following on uh, these great reliefs in the cathedral, uh, and it seems to us, at the same time, Luca was uh, working on what is by far his masterpiece in this glazed terracotta medium that he is, has invented. And he's made the leap from a relief sculpture which is obviously closer to painting. It's flatter. These, are, these figures are quite uh, are flat. They're attached to this back plane. In this other commission for the visitation, he's made the leap into creating sculpture in the round in this glazed terracotta. So now he's truly uh, working uh, not just as a relief sculptor close to paintings. He's really taking on uh, sculpture in the round, which is you know, what we think of as when we think of uh, classical antiquity, marble sculptures, right, in addition to the, to the sarcophagi relief. He's made this leap, and he has detached his figures from that background and created these extraordinary life-sized, or just under life-sized, but they feel life-sized figures of uh, the visitation. And I show, I show you the, them in our um, installation in the show. Uh, the, the figures of uh, Mary and Elizabeth. Um, I want to say a word about the, um, about the subject. It is uh, the, the visitation of, Saint, uh, of, of Mary to St. Elizabeth. And this is, like those reliefs, this is a very important uh, gospel narrative. So Luca is trying as hard as he can to tell this story in the most compelling way. Here we have just two figures, but, uh, but it, uh, it is um, an extraordinarily dramatic, beautiful narrative moment. It comes directly from, uh, 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 when, you, when you leave, I have the whole thing here, but I won't read it to you. I want you to go home and read the first chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke, because that will really give you the uh, context for this uh, miraculous sculpture, uh, because it tells the story of several miracles. Uh, Luke, the narrative in Luke actually opens with the, um, the prediction of the birth of St. John the Baptist. So St. Elizabeth is actually the mother of St. John the Baptist, and the Gospel of Luke starts with, um, with Elizabeth, who is elderly, and has always been ashamed of the fact that she has not been able to conceive a child. So an angel comes 
and talks to her husband, Zachariah, and says, your wife is going gonna, is gonna to have a baby. You're going to have a son. And he said, well, what do you mean? We're old. We've been trying forever. It's not going to happen. And uh, the angel says, well, you haven't believed me. You will not speak until the baby is born. But believe me, she's going to have a baby. And she, and she does. She, uh, she's six months into her pregnancy when another angel comes to visit her cousin uh, Mary, her young cousin Mary, and tells her that she is going to become pregnant, and she says, but I'm a virgin, and he said, she, they said, the grace of the Lord is on you, and you will conceive uh, a child, and that child will be uh, the son of God. So Elizabeth, at the, at Mary, at the same time, hears that her elderly cousin is also pregnant. So she, she's, she's, a little con she's, she's astonished at the grace that has, been, uh, has fallen upon her, uh, but she runs to visit her elderly cousin. When she arrives, St. John the Baptist, in Elizabeth's womb, leaps in recognition of the holiness and of the presence of Christ in Mary's womb. And so what we have here is that moment when they each kind of realize that very big things uh, are happening that are completely beyond their understanding, but they believe. And so, um, so the incredible moment is so beautifully expressed here by this locking of, ga of gazes between these two women. Uh, Elizabeth has fallen down on her knees. Mary reaches down to embrace her. And uh, they this moment is conveyed so beautifully by Luca, the, 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 the miracle of it, but also the wonder of it, and the humility that these two women uh, express. So I want to tell you a little bit about its original setting. We don't know too much about where this group belonged, but it, it, uh, it is... Um, it was made for the church of San Giovanni for Civitas, which is a small church in Pistoia, about a half hour by train outside Florence. And this is, you enter into the side of this building, strangely enough, and the door is here. Do you see this little niche here? Well, that's where the visitation uh, is normally uh, housed today. The high altar is here. Uh, it is over an altar, in a niche, behind glass. Uh, and here's an, uh, an image of it in its niche. And you can see that it's sort of, it's rather hard to see. Um, and um, it also, it very likely, from everything we can tell about the sculpture and how it looks, it was very likely originally on this side. And I'll, sh I'll show you why. Uh, so it, um, it, um, there's one document that's dated to 1445, that describes figures that were made for the confraternity of Saint Elizabeth in San Giovanni for Civitas. So we believe that it might actually have decorated an altar space or a chapel space where uh, um, this confraternity devoted to Saint Elizabeth would have met and prayed. So you have to imagine that the female audience that that implies would have been particularly moved by these, uh, this uh, moment of enormous import uh, brought, to, brought, to be, and brought into being by these two women. So um, it, it really and truly is, um, anybody that has heard me speak about this, uh, this exhibition will have heard me say that if you, saw this, if you see this, this piece in our galleries, some kind of miracle has occurred. Because it, really, um, it is really one of the most important um, sculptures in the, in the town of Pistoia, much beloved. Um, but the, there, the, the idea that it would come to America and be even better known and be better, people would be able to see it and appreciate it, seems to have convinced the church authorities and the artistic authorities in Florence to let it come. But the first thing we had to be sure about was whether or not it could travel safely. And this uh, brings up another aspect of the Della Robbia technique, which I alluded to, and that is that these figures are actually made in four distinct pieces. 
which I show you as they were um, being uncrated for installation in our galleries. So, do you, so you see this is the bottom part of Mary and this is her top. Here's the bottom part of Elizabeth and this is her, her top. So um, they come together and, uh, and if you don't know that, you'd have to really look to see where, where the pieces join together. Uh, they, the Della Robbia, in the Renaissance, we don't know how big the kilns were, but we do know that it would have made life much easier to fire this kind of large-scale figure in pieces. Uh, so, uh, so that is what they did, and I say this uh, often. Uh, these guys, these fi this parts of the figures are actually kind of like very elaborate flower pots. They are very thick-walled, but they are hollowed out so that, um, so that, that they would fire safely. They're very sturdy. And so that's what gave us the courage to even ask for the objects, because the, the, this sculpture, because we knew that as long as they were stable and there weren't major cracks, that they could actually be packed safely and travel. And the Della Robbia knew this as well. This is part and parcel of their technique, that they made things in pieces in their Florentine workshop, and then that way they could be shipped off to their um, to their locations and put together there. So the other miraculous thing about this group is that there, actually, there was no adhesive to hold them together and there are no pins to hold them together. They just fit together perfectly. And here you see us putting, it, putting them together um, in, in the gallery uh, very, very carefully because it's that moment of joining them together that you could have cracks along, or breaks along the joins. And then when you, uh, oh, and I want to show you this because uh, this is how the sculpture looked when, we, when, when it was deinstalled from the church and brought to the, um, the conservation studios. You can see that it's pretty filthy. There was mold and dust and smoke uh, um, on her. Uh, but the material really and truly endures beautifully over time. It might get dirty, but as long as you don't drop it, and even if you do drop it, you can put it back together, but as long as, you, as, long as it's intact, you, can't, you go from something this um, really filthy to this beautiful, pure, white, shiny surface. When Vasari said he makes clay sculptures that are almost eternal, he was right. Uh, so um, I also love this because you see here, this is one of the beauties of this, this sculpture. This is the back of the Virgin. And what you see here is, is Elizabeth's hands. And uh, each of the hands of each of the figures are modeled and fired with the upper bodies of the other, of the other figure. So they fit together like a, a, a three-dimensional puzzle. And in itself, to me, that is extraordinarily moving. Um, uh, as, a, as a vision for how Luca imagined this sculpture being made. And this is actually a beautiful view of this beautiful, his draperies are extraordinary and subtle. So here you see the, the, the gazes between the beautiful, uh, young, smooth face of, of Mary with her very elegant updo and the beautiful elderly face of St. Elizabeth wearing a cowl draped heavily and this incredible uh, moment between them that says so much even though it's very quiet. I just, I'm just gonna run a few of these slides for you to, to get a sense of. So youth and age, it encompasses all humanity, right? And we can think forward to somebody like Leonardo da Vinci, who at the, at the end of the, of the 15th century loved exactly this kind of contrast between the, the elderly face and the youthful face. Uh, it's here already in Luca. Um, the, the exquisite uh, beauty of the face of Mary. Uh, Mary is uh, born without sin, that's the Immaculate Conception, so that she can be the proper vessel for Christ, right? Uh, her exquisite beauty, which, is cha which changes as you go around the group, 
uh, is actually a sign in the Renaissance. Beauty is a sign of grace. So you should. So you, as an artist, you are seeking the most beautiful um, uh, image that you can when creating uh, the, the, the figure of Mary. And I like to look forward to Michelangelo, who I almost imagine had to have seen uh, the beautiful young uh, Mary in Luca's group when he carved his, uh, his extraordinary Roman pieta, the, 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 mother of Christ, mo mo the mother of Christ holding the dead body on her lap, but she's extraordinarily young. That is a very unusual representation of this scene because actually Mary is older by now. But it's the beauty and grace that Michelangelo chooses to, to stress. And um, I just think that there is some kind of cosmic connection between these groups, even if they weren't, if, even if Michelangelo didn't, wasn't directly inspired by Luca. Uh, and there you see the group again in the, in the galleries. It, um, I, I want to say a word about the, the white here. In the Renaissance, the purity of this white would have, had, um, would have had sort of connotations of purity and joyousness. They saw white as a happy color, a joyful color. Uh, so that brilliant purity is part and parcel, again, of Luca's beautiful invention of this white glaze. Uh, we know that he could very well have done it in color because he did. And I show you here another sculpture that's in our galleries, uh, a, a sculpture of the Madonna and Child, uh, and uh, probably of a, around the same time as the visitation. And you can see that he's got purples and blues and greens. And they actually have blonde hair. Um, and he, he, he could do this. This is a sculpture that is on the, um, on the facade of the church of Or San Michele. Uh, and it is one of the great uh, locations for sculpture in early Renaissance Florence, uh, where a, a whole group of sculptures were, uh, were created for these niches. Here's Luca's contribution to this uh, important complex. It's this roundel, which you see here. And when you're walking down the street in Florence, you look up, and they look down at you. So that vivid color, that adorable, these adorable faces, the blonde hair, the colorful uh, impact. In this situation, Luca chose to use color, right? So he can, he can achieve all these glazes in colors as well. And it's about communication, right? And it's about expressiveness. So this is the place where Ghiberti does his, uh, his saint in, in the teens when Luca's a kid running around Florence, this series of sculptures of St. John the Baptist by Ghiberti, um, St. George by Donatello, uh, St. Mark by Donatello, and then St. Uh, St. Matthew by Ghiberti. This is the pantheon of Florentine sculpture. And Luca's contribution is this wonderful, colorful, um, um, uh, uh, glazed terracotta Madonna and Child. And every time I, I, I look at this, uh, I, I look at this um, um, uh, image, we, uh, people can't help but comment that the stone into which it is set is falling apart, but it's in perfect condition, even though it's been outside. It could use a good cleaning. I wish that they would um, get up there and dust it off and clean it. Um, but here's the, here's the Madonna and Child in our galleries. And uh, it's the sweetest little baby. Uh, he's our goofy little kid. Uh, he has great energy, and they're, you know, they're both blondes. But to me, this beautiful comparison between the Madonna of the Visitation and the Madonna from of uh, it, it, the colorful Madonna uh, really is uh, just an extraordinary opportunity to compare this. I mean, it's as if okay, so this is this is Mary. Now she's a mother and she's not sleeping, right? She's got bags and she, <laughs> but she's still that very very beautiful uh, ideal uh, ideal uh, face. And again and again, you can look at, at Luca's Madonnas and just find this exquisite, uh, these exquisite faces and these wonderful babies in all sorts of positions. I just remind you, Luca's coming from a tradition. Remember the, the Andrea Pisano that we looked at? It has some of that. I mean, that's a pretty goofy baby too. He's having a good time. And you start to, as you start to look at these sculptures in the gallery, there's this kind of amazing um, dialogue of hands and feet. I've been gotten kind of obsessed with feet lately. So I've been really looking at the way, for example, the little baby presses against the, 
the, the, the drapery of his, you know, this energy that this little kid has, or the foot pressing into the drapery. It's, it's actually got classical resonances again. I'm showing you a, 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 a sculpture of the sleeping hermaphrodite, which Ghiberti knew and wrote about, and he particularly talks about the way, for example, the foot presses into the drapery. Do you see that? I think that's what Luca's doing. So is that a little classical reference that we don't, we, we might not um, immediately imagine because this is so lifelike and so charming? I think it could be. So then I start saying, I'm just gonna keep running these images of hands. Look at the way her hands, the elderly hands of Elizabeth press into the, to the back into the drapery of, of, of Mary. Mary's hands pressing in. This is clay. So again, if you think about marble, this is clay and it has the softness and it literally preserves, this beautiful glaze literally preserves Luca's hands on the clay. It's one of the most, so there's no, it, it's, it's direct. It, it's, it's, it's direct. He's not using a chisel. He's not using files. He's using his hands. And I think it can't be an accident that therefore these moments of extraordinary um, tactility are such an important part of his work. Look at this. I mean, they're just, again, look at the way. This is actually described in ancient texts as well, that uh, when you're a really good marble carver, you can, it's as if you can see the pressure of the fingers into the flesh. Well, here, the softness of the clay, uh, it is, it's the perfect medium for those kinds of thoughts. Even something like this, the, the choices of how you would have a Madonna and child in your home. You could have a painted Madonna, or you could have a sculpted Madonna. And to me, it's that tactility. It's practically like his, her, her, her fingers press into his little baby, soft baby skull um, on, the, on the beautiful relief from Detroit. Look at the way his little feet grab the platform. I mean, it's, and he's up on his toes, but his little feet are, are actually uh, gripping uh, the platform. So, um, so uh, spend time with these sculptures because this is, what, this is what Luca does that is incredible. I want to move on to uh, look at um, the work of Luca's nephew, Andrea della Robbia. So Luca invents this technique. He keeps it as a secret within his family. He himself doesn't have children, but his nephew, Andrea, works with him in his shop for about 30 years. Uh, and uh, one of the great masterpieces in the show is this little boy uh, by Andrea della Robbia from the Bargello in Florence. And many of those things that we've been talking about with Luca, that softness, that personality, the, the, the sense of a living being is epitomized in this little image of this little boy. It's not, it's not, we don't, it might be a portrait, but we don't know who he is, but we feel like we might know who he is. He's so vivid. And um, again, just to stay with some of the, um, Rena the way the Renaissance talked about the Della Robbia, I, I wanted to quote to you a, a, a writer who in 1504 wrote a book on sculpture. And he um, talks about Luca, and he says that he invented this technique. But about Andrea, he says, um, Andrea is inferior to no one that I know. Uh, and uh, one would believe that nature herself had created uh, these things that his hand has modeled. So uh, the, the incredible naturalism was extremely, was immediately apparent to his contemporaries as well. So Andrea is still alive when Garricus is writing in 1504. And it does look like this is created, this, this guy is real to us. Um, and uh, there's this wonderful moment in the early, Rena in the Renaissance where children, we, were lo we looked before at those wonderful, the little children in, in, in um, Luca's Cantoria. But all of a sudden, childhood becomes an interesting state and worth recording. And I show you the beautiful uh, laughing boy uh, in marble by a, a sculptor named Desiderio da Settignano. Uh, but it is um, Andrea who uh, truly captures this moment of childhood, living, breathing flesh, that again, that softness of the clay allows him to, um, allows him to achieve. 
And I can't resist see you can see from the back. Uh, we, we one of our the, one of the conservators from Italy that came to 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 help install the visitation couldn't resist uh, interacting with uh, the little boy by Andrea. And I love to show this because of you see how his hair is tied back in this sweet little bow. He's it's it's just like he's just like a little kid that you might be taking care of. Uh, Andrea's most famous uh, uh, works uh, decorate a hospital in Florence that was built by Brunelleschi. And uh, these are probably among the most famous Della Robbia's. I have to admit, I long thought they were by Luca. They are not. They are by Andrea. And um, they are each different. And uh, so this, uh, this hospital was a foundling hospital. It still exists uh, and functions to a degree today. Uh, there's a wonderful museum inside as well. It's the, the Ospedale degli Innocenti, the hospital of the foundlings, basically. And it really points out, again, a notion of uh, Florentine civic responsibility. It's one of the earliest foundling hospitals. There was this sense of uh, responsibility to children born in Florence in whatever condition uh, they were born, and, th and there would be a safe place for these children. Uh, and uh, that really came home to me when I started to really look at these little guys, whom I always thought, ah, oh, they're all the same, you know, but they're not. They all have their own personalities. They have different draperies, different expressions. Um, and, and it's as if it's a reminder that every child deserves care. That's a really amazing, uh, an amazing um, value, this value of civic charity. Uh, that is so much a part of Florentine life in the Renaissance. Right now, if you go to Florence, I haven't been able to do this yet. They've just conserved all of the Innocenti, and this is how you can look at them in the installation. So if you can go, go. I'm going to try uh, before they actually put them back on. They're, they're arguing about whether or not to put them back outside. Uh, so we have the opportunity now to really study them. Uh, and in our show, uh, these uh, wonderful... Uh, little angels from a private collection kind of stand in for the Innocenti. Again, these wonderful, uh, expressive uh, faces in, uh, in Andrea. Um, but it wasn't always sweetness and light for Andrea. I show, you a, um, I show you a snapshot taken by me last March in the monastery of, San, of, of La Verna in the middle of the Tuscan hills. Uh, it was sunny in Florence, and it was snowing in La Verna. And this complex uh, um, holds some of the most spectacular Della Robbia's. I would recommend it as a pilgrimage to anyone. I, it took me a long time to get there. I went for the first time this past March, though I have long wanted to go. It's one of the most moving and beautiful places you will um, ever uh, go to. Uh, and it's filled with sculptures by Andrea Della Robbia, including this spectacular um, resurrection of Christ uh, and uh, a, a, an altarpiece, and it really shows the way um, the, the way Andrea developed the potential for production in the shop. We already saw the wonderful reliefs of, by Luca in the cathedral. They too were made in sections. So here too, this very large, it fills the, the whole wall of the chapel, very large uh, sculpture. I think it's made in 88 pieces. And again, it's the kind of thing that he, they would have made in the Florentine shop and then would have trucked up the mountains in, in carts drawn by oxen uh, and put together in its original location. And we have documents about Andrea going in the 1480s to put this together, put, put these sculptures together. I, I show you a closer view. I hope you can see how subtle the coloration really has become because can you see how the body of Christ is sort of a bluish green? So he's dead, so he's, um, Andrea is actually working the flesh colors uh, to reflect that. He's got wonderful red, reddish brown hair. Um, and uh, so the, this actually leads into the last sculpture I want to spend a little time with. Uh, and what is the first sculpture that you see when you walk into the exhibition. Uh, because it too is on, on, a, on a very ambitious scale. And this is now by uh, Giovanni della Robbia. So Luca didn't have kids, but Andrea worked with him, learned the secret recipes, et cetera. 
Andrea had 12 children, five of whom were sculptors, and three of those uh, of his sons are represented in the show, the most famous of whom is Giovanni della Robbia, who created the spectacular uh, Resurrection of Christ. That is the first work that you see when you walk into the exhibition. So what you're going to notice right away, uh, even in the slide, but especially in the gallery, a couple of things that you could now tell me about, right, that it's made in pieces because it would have been made in the shop and, tra and then transported. Uh, we've already talked quite a bit about the subject of the resurrection of Christ. We're a long way from the, um, from the, from the image of the resurrection of Luca, which was quite, um, uh, quite quiet in comparison. The soldiers sleep through it, the angels above. Uh, but here you see what happens. Christ is rising from the tomb. The, the, the old gentleman uh, soldier is still asleep. He's just starting to open his eyes. But the other soldiers are actually responding to something. They feel that something's happening, but they don't quite know what it is. And so you have this extraordinarily energetic uh, rendition of these, uh, of these soldiers responding. Um, but remember, we just looked at Andrea with the, the, the color of the, of, the, of the dead Christ. One of um, Giovanni's incredible uh, abilities was to, have, to achieve a wide variety of colors of the flesh. Uh, so this, the glazing technique is becoming ever more sophisticated. Um, here you see uh, a, a praying figure who is, yes, he's bigger than Christ. He is the donor. He actually paid for this relief. <laughs> and uh, by doing that, he, um, he puts himself in this great moment of salvation. And he prays, and he prays for the salvation of his soul and for the salvation of his family. Uh, the coats of arms here indicate that this was uh, commissioned by the Antonori family of Florence, and we believe he is either Niccolo or Alessandro Antonori. Um, and so, very fairly common to have a donor in Renaissance paintings and sculptures. Very unusual to see him so so prominent in front and center, right under the blessing hand of Christ. But he, again, he's our bridge into this, uh, into this relief. You, we should be praying the way he is. He's the same size we are when you see him in the gallery. Um, so I just want to take a little walk through. Here's the, here's the Luca, which we looked at quite a bit with the sleeping soldiers. Here's a painted rendition from, our, so Luca, 1442 to 4. Piero della Francesca. Resurrection of Christ, you see this wonderful group of sleeping soldiers. This dates to the 1460s. Um, and then Giovanni, who takes some, some pretty extraordinarily expressive leaps in, in this uh, rendition of the, of the uh, resurrection, uh, probably around 1520 to 25. So this is the same period that you know Raphael and Michelangelo and, uh, and Leonardo are painting. And what we see in this leap from Luca at the beginning to Giovanni really at the peak of creativity for this uh, for the and, and and expressiveness for this material, you see a much wider range of color, uh, much more animated uh, uh, um, uh, field of narrative, wonderful uh, uh, garland all around. At this point, in about 1520, this material is really kind of vying with, with painting for, its, uh, for expressive and, um, um, and technical strides. Remember Vasari saying that this stuff could endure forever? Well, Leonardo says the same thing about Della Robbia sculpture. And that's the last quote I want to read to you. Uh, Leonardo uh, says, um, in a, in a series of, um, the Renaissance loved to do this, they like to compare things to see what was better. So there's a whole series of dialogues and discussions uh, about the comparison between painting and sculpture and which is better. And one of the things that help makes um, sculpture better is that it endures over time. So a marble sculpture tends to survive. We've talked a lot about how what Luca accomplished with this glazing was that he allowed his colors to survive. He allowed clay sculpture to survive. Well, Leonardo recognized this because uh, he knew very well that, um, that many of his painted surfaces did not survive that well. 
As soon as he painted The Last Supper, it started falling off the wall, right? So he actually talks about the Della Robbia, and Leonardo doesn't give a lot of credit to a lot of, um, a lot of individual artists in his writings. And he says, um, he, he talks about the idea of permanence. And he says, uh, the same kind of permanence can also be found um, in, um, um, in, in enamels, on metals, or on terracotta. These can be seen in several places in France and in Italy, and most of all in Florence, among the Della Robbia family, who uh, discovered a way to carry out every kind of great work in painting, and to um, and to um, and to cover and covered it with glaze. So he actually turns this this sculpture into a painting, and he says, you know, the Della Robbia are great because they figured out how to paint colors that wouldn't ever fade. Uh, and that's what he credits the Della Robbia with. He pulls them into the world of painting. And um, that is one of the, the, the most wonderful things about this sculpture. Uh, ah, the Last Supper falls apart. Uh, so certainly Leonardo appreciates that. Um, but I want to look at some of these details where you see flat painting on, on terracotta. But do you see this section of white? When, when I first started to look at the sculpture, I was a little curious about whether those were replacement tiles. But the more I look at it, I think what's happening here is that Giovanni is trying to give you a sense of depth. And he's trying to create that sense of, of uh, the way, um, so you see the way it gets kind of fuzzy here? He's actually doing what Leonardo does in painting so brilliantly. And that is he creates this kind of sfumato, very famous, the sfumato modeling the atmospheric distance. So understanding that when you see things in the distance, you're seeing it through air and through uh, atmosphere. So things get sort of fuzzy and they fade to white. I think that's what Giovanni is attempting to do here. I think he's taking Leonardo at his game and trying to create a painting, a sculpture that is also a painting. Um, my absolute favorite part of this relief is this scene, this little uh, passage where you see the cypress trees blowing in the wind and you see birds flying. And you see, again, there's that blue sky that fades to white. Well, I think it comes way back to um, Donatello uh, and the invention of flattened relief, schiacciato relief, where in the distance of his relief of St. George and the Dragon, and I'm showing it to you in black and white on purpose because it actually reads better, you see this passage in the, in the deep, deep uh, uh, depths of this relief where what's happening here? The breeze is blowing through the trees, right? It's this quality of how atmosphere affects the objects that you're looking at. Donatello was a, uh, was, a, was brilliant in this way. He passes it on to Masaccio, one of the guys that, that Alberti praises. We can see a great example of this very flattened relief where uh, you get the sense of uh, things kind of getting s s less sharply defined as you get into the distance. Uh, that breeze, Leonardo, one of his most beautiful and famous botanical drawings, what makes this spectacular is that not just the close observation, but the sense of air that's causing it to move around. Well, I think that that's what Giovanni's trying to do here. And that's pretty extraordinary, you, to, to be able to, um, to see that in color as well. Um, it quickly, uh, he also loves little animals. And I show you um, some of the wonderful animals that are in the garland. I can't resist showing. I'm sure you'll see this next week. But do you see that squirrel up there? Yeah. Well, there in the this drawing, over to it. This is actually inside one of the one of the clay uh, tiles on the resurrection, and there's a little sketch in the clay for the for the squirrel. Yeah. Um, so this attention to these, and he's in the same pose, and he's he's adorable. This attention to detail—it's not the subtlety of a Leonardo drawing, but you know, but Leon, but they are trying to capture the natural the natural world, and you see that in the splendid garland. Of, our, of the prudence from the Metropolitan Museum, that sharpness and attention to detail uh, and capturing the natural world in clay. Um, so I, in conclusion, I want to just uh, end with this sculpture, this um, amazing um, architectural um, ensemble by Giovanni della Robbia. 
um, because it is a uh, wash basin that is located in the sacristy of the Church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. So it's the place where the priest goes to get dressed uh, in order to prepare himself to say Mass, which is close by. So he goes to the, 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 the wash basin and washes his hands. Uh, and uh, the Renaissance loves to uh, create this kind of amazing architectural um, um, artistic setting for these kinds of liturgical moments. And it's an extraordinary moment because uh, here is uh, this beautiful landscape right above the spigots, right? Here's where, you'd wa this, these, the, the, here's where the priest would be washing his hands to, to purify his hands literally to serve mass. But as he's doing it, not, he's looking out onto this landscape uh, and this is painted on flat tiles. So it's Giovanni literally painting in his glazes. So something that Leonardo would have loved, right? Uh, particularly since uh, it, it could relate very well to a drawing by Leonardo, who uh, is, this is a drawing, 1480, uh, 1485, I believe, the Arno landscape. And Leonardo records exactly where and when he drew this. And it's always thought is, um, as one of the early pure landscapes in the history of Italian Renaissance art, pure landscapes. It filled, it's not a background landscape. You see, this is this passage here. But it's a pure landscape. And Giovanni della Robbia does this 1498 uh, in, uh, at this, in this lavabo. Uh, and there's, a, uh, sorry, there's one more quote I want to read. because, um, And I'm going to go back to where we started with Alberti, who talks about landscape. And he says, um, as, as architectural decoration, and he says, our minds are delighted in a particular manner with the pictures of landscapes, of havens, and of tiny, of, of, of living, of, uh, and of flowery fields and thick groves. Those who suffer from fever are offered much relief by the sight of painted uh, fountains and rivers and running brooks. He also suggests imagining those things to help you fall asleep at night. If you're, if, you're, if you're not sleeping well, imagine that you're in a beautiful garden setting or a beautiful landscape. There's this beautiful uh, coming together of how art can actually uh, affect human emotion. And um, imagine the priest preparing not just his body, but his mind to serve mass. Uh, and that's uh, Giovanni della Robbia, who would have thunk, right? So uh, around 1498. So um, I'm going to stop there and take some questions if you have any. Um, but I hope that this will help you appreciate even more the beautiful sculptures that are over in the Torf Gallery. Good morning. Um, you said a lot of the statues, was, they tried to compete with antiquity. Yes. But most of the statues, as you know, in antiquity were polychromed. Sorry? I could, I most of the statues in antiquity were polychromatic. Yes. It, bleh, why didn't he do his original um, figures in polychrome? Uh, it's a great question uh, because um, I think more and more we are trying to figure out, we know that the Renaissance understood that ancient sculptures were, were painted. We don't know how much of that paint survived that they might have been able to see in the Renaissance, certainly more than we see today. We'll never know that. But we do know that Renaissance artists understood that um, marble sculpture in antiquity was painted. So all of this that we've been looking at is an emulation, possibly, that's one aspect, is an emulation of antique techniques of colored sculpture. I think one of the surprising things is that Renaissance sculpture is as colorful as, uh, as it is, often on works of terracotta or marble, if paint was applied, it's, lo it's been lost, it's slipped away. So you'll often see, you'll, it, as, as we do more and more conservation on works of sculpture in exterior settings, we're finding more and more evidence of paint and gilding. So there was a lot more surface decoration. And 
whether that was continuity or if that was a direct emulation of classical sculpture and sc classical art is one of the great questions that works like the Della Robbia's uh, rays. Because sometimes, one of the things that people like to do right now is because you can find these little minuscule um, uh, samples of evidence of color in, in ancient sculpture, there's a lot of recreations online of what the original polychromy looked like. And every now and then, it looks really close to certain Della Robbia sculptures. So did Luca know more than we know, or did he imagine it? And, uh, and when I say Luca, I mean the whole group, Luca, Giovann Luca Andrea Giovanni and company. So it's a great question, and it's one of the questions that we love to actually um, consider. I just wondered, you said that they were all done in pieces, but how were they attached you know, to the, to right. the buildings? So the visitation, four pieces fit together by gravity. We believe that when they're put into their architectural settings, it's actually kind of the framing. They, as people have been studying these more and more, we're discovering that there's a very specific order in which you put the sculpture together. And so we think they did not expect these things to come out of the locations where they are originally located, were originally made for. We believe, because people are looking for things like adhesive, and cer certainly there was some kind of facing for the, some kind of, um, uh, but we don't know what, something that helped it um, attach to the back. But we believe that actually they fit together so well that they supported themselves in the setting. It's one of the big questions, because anytime something comes out of its original setting, people say, is there any adhesive? Is there anything that, you know, are there, are there, are there clips? Are there... Are there are there um, pins? For example, the 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 reliefs in the Duomo have never come out of their original location, so we don't know all the secrets yet. So, it's an open question, and maybe Abby can answer it better next week. <laughs> yeah. I'm just I'm curious about the the um, the history of the gallons. The history of the, the, the garlands, garlands, yeah. Yeah, was that unique to Della Robbia? Uh, it's not completely unique to Della Robbia. They certainly reflect a couple of things. We know that when there were important parades and, pr and processions in Florence, they were decorated, often decorated with swags of fruits and flowers. So this makes those kinds of objects permanent. Um, they appear, uh, a Madonna and child image in a church would often be decorated with flowers. So when you see the, that's another reason why I love the, the, the lavabo, the, the wash basin. That's a more, that's probably a more typical Renaissance garland than we see as a frame because you see how it just hangs down. Uh, and, uh, and that's the kind of swag and drape of, of, of these kinds of, uh, of natural garlands and their records of that. How much you can interpret them as, as kind of, um, symbolic of something that's going on inside the frames, we don't really know. Uh, sometimes it seems clear, but other times not. Uh, but certainly when you have something like the resurrection or the prudence, those garlands serve to separate this holy sphere from the, it's a bridge to the natural world that we live in. So there are a number of ways this material has been, um, has been interpreted. And I, think, I still think there's a ways to go. What kind of a kiln did he use? So they must have been very big. Um, we, we think that that's, he probably used the same sort of kiln that uh, Maiolica, uh, or you know, people that are making ceramic vessels. We have some images of kilns. It, it's a big question how big the kiln actually got. Uh, and some, and sometimes, I mean, we know that they could fire things about that big, maximum, um, probably maximum. Uh, so they, they were certainly using the same kinds of kilns that, uh, that people that were making ceramic vessels were using. We have images of those kinds of kilns. One last question. Sorry. Um, this relates a little bit to that. Do, do, you, do you think that, that he felt 
limited in the size of figures he could create because of the technical issues? Uh, I, I, are, are honestly, there like uh, full size or? There are some very large sculptures at the end of the show. They're almost life-sized, sort of the end of this technique. But terracotta sculpture can often be um, can often be life-sized because they do cut them into pieces. He might well have modeled it as a single image, and then there, he would have done the cutting. And, and Luke is amazing at always hiding those joins. And that would then be the moment when he would hollow out the sculpture so that it could fire safely. So uh, I'm trying to think what the largest terracotta from the Renaissance that I know of, they get quite big. Uh, over, they can get over life size, not colossal, not the David, but they, get, they can get quite big. And it's strange because Luca, after the visitation, you know, there are not that many uh, sculptures in the round made by Luca. I think the, 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 the um, Andrea does a few annunciations. I think it really worked beautifully in this uh, for relief sculpture. I think it might have gotten a little harder when they were doing sculptures in the round. Uh, the St. John the Baptist, which is about this big in the show and in our collection, was fired in a single piece. We know that he modeled it and then he cut it apart to hollow it out, but he put it together back together before he fired it. And so it came out of the kiln the first time and then it was glazed and was refired. So the kiln could hold it. Um, so I think I think you know there there are certain limitations, but I think they felt pretty. I mean, look at the resurrection that in in, in Laverna that I showed you. It's monumental. It's a relief, but it's a monumental um, uh, sculpture. Thank you so much, Mary Evans. Thanks Thank everyone you. for coming today.